Okay, chapter 22, epigraph. There ain't no devil, that's just God when he's drunk. Tom Waits. Three times in a row, I had a man. He wanted to talk to me all day. He didn't want to talk to anyone else. We talked deep, staring into eyes talking, stories from forever talking. But the night would come and the man would leave. Finally, I said, I love you that way. He said, I love you, but not that way. One, there was a local musician who worked at Dot's Dishes, Lee. He played jazz guitar and sang in a duo. He wrote some of the songs. Sorry. <laughs> Lee had chaotic curly brown hair. He was tall and thin. He had beautiful blue eyes behind thick rimmed glasses. He didn't smile readily. I thought he didn't like me. On stage, Lee was irresistible. He sang long scat lines like Stevie Wonder or Al Jarreau, and there was something about the way he pronounced the word love. All at, at his gigs, the audience was mostly women, staring longingly. I was one of them. There had been that moment in the mountains when a sandy-haired, blue-eyed boy man with pursed lips and lowered eyes had walked across a bridge and put his head in my lap. One night I had a dream in which Lee opened the door of his car and asked me to get in. I looked up and Bill was standing off in the distance. He said, go ahead, I'll be here when you get back. At the end of a long day at Dots, I sat in one of the booths with Lee eating lunch. Tish, he said in what sounded like a normal tone. Yes, Lee, I said in the same tone, but somewhat exaggerated. Would you like to go on a date? I looked at him stunned. A date? Yeah, a movie. There's a Curacao movie, Ran. We could go together. A date. He was smiling now. Uh, sure, okay, a date. I tried to appear casual and bemused, but my heart was racing. I told him I'd meet him at the theater. That afternoon, I went to visit, visit a friend who worked in a hair salon. She and the other women fixed my hair and put, I put on makeup. We giggled and talked about the slings and arrows of outrageous romance. When I arrived at the theater, Lee was standing there with his brother. I thought it was odd to bring a sibling on a date. You have on makeup. Yeah, I am on a date, I said, trying to sound sardonic. Lee looked uncomfortable. When we went into the theater, he wanted to sit in the back. I wanted to sit in the front. I always sat in the front. I loved to be overwhelmed by the movie. He had a vision issue and required more distance from the screen. Well, just sit here with your brother and I'll meet you after the movie. Tish, we're on a date. You have to sit with me. And so, I did with, too, with what too many women on dates do. I did what the guy wanted me to do. When the movie was over, he said he was gonna get a beer with his brother. I walked home trying to remember that Bill was my soulmate who wanted a boyfriend who brings his brother on dates anyway. I rubbed off the makeup and went to bed. The next day, Lee asked if I wanted to go to another movie. I asked if his brother was coming. He said, no, we both laughed. We began spending a lot of time together. For a few months, my life was like a fairy tale. I had a band, he had a band. I went to his gigs, he went to mine. We went to see other bands together. We worked at Dots. I was a waitress, he was a dishwasher. Pretty romantic stuff. He was also dating another woman. He said he was going through a personally difficult time. He said I was the only person that he really wanted to be with or talk to. He said he was too confused to be in love. I wasn't confused. I wanted to be in love. Bill might be my soulmate, but Lee was right there sitting across from me in the little bar at the Hotel Boulderado that we frequ fre frequented. He drank Dos Equis. I drank Johnny Walker Black. I started smoking again so I could feel the brush of his fingers when he lit my cigarette. We bought little folded magazine page squares. We, we bought little, oh yeah. We bought little folded magazine squares filled with cocaine. I felt the warmth of his fingers under the little mirror that he held while I lowered the rolled up dollar bill to the line of white powder. It might not be love, he might not be my soulmate, but he was right there. He was there until late in the evening when he, when he would go to the other woman's house to sleep. One evening I sat by my phone waiting for Lee to call, thinking about Bill and the idea of a soulmate. I hadn't seen or heard from Bill in months. The phone wasn't ringing, Lee wasn't calling. I must be crazy, I said out loud. Baba is my matchmaker. I'm not sitting around here waiting for anybody anymore. I went to the little bar in the Hotel Boulderado. I sat and talked to the bartender a while. for a while. Then I went upstairs to the mezzanine, another bar. This one had a band playing. 
I was out on the town, on my own, ready for anything. A friend had a little kitchen off the mezzanine where she made samosas. I went to her kitchen to talk and have a snack. Her phone rang. Tish, you have a telephone call. It was Lee. He'd called me at home. He'd called me at the little bar to see if I was there and the bartender told him I was upstairs. He called me there. They told him I was in the samosa shop. He'd made four calls to find me. He wanted to get together. Baba is my matchmaker, I thought. This went on for a few months. Lee never said he wasn't attracted to me because I was fat, but the other woman he was dating was thin. It seemed obvious. He talked to me about his problems with her. One day I said, I have no love for this woman and I do have love for you, but I don't want, and I don't want you to be with her, but I can't sit here listening while you talk shit about her and then go home and fuck her. He looked, he just looked at me. The next day he told me he'd broken up with her. I began to hope, but things stayed the same. We sat on the little porch outside my window, knee to knee, talking and talked and drank and did. Did you hear that? There was like a truck outside. It made a loud noise. It made me jump. Scary. <laughs> okay. Uh, we smoked cigarettes and talked some more. And then we went home. One day I just said, go away. And he did. He began dating another woman that night. They were married rather quickly. Everyone in Boulder knew about it and everyone was so happy for them. No one ever said it, but when people talked when people talked to me about Lee and his new wife, I felt like they were saying, you didn't expect him to marry you, did you? No, I expected something much more serious. I expected him to be with me, all of me. I had been living in an extended period of grace. Rebirthing India, the band, all seemed to be blessings to me directly from God. I took chances. I pushed myself. I believed that I might have found love. The idea that this lack of love might be because of this might be because of my size was impossible to accept. A lack of money hadn't kept me from India. Why was a why was being fat keeping me from romantic love? I worked at Dots and played music occasionally, but I was drinking a lot and doing cocaine. I went to see other people play music. If Lee walked in, I stormed out. Boulder was a small town. My romantic failure had been a public spectacle. Two. And then one day, a friend called me at Dots and asked if I had seen Bill. Bill? He was in Boulder. He was in town. I called him and made a plan to meet him at a hair salon where I worked part-time cleaning. He knocked on the door and I went to unlock it. There he was. He was wearing a tan trench coat and his hands were shoved into the pockets. His head was down, his lips were pursed. He slowly raised his eyes and smiled. We sat in the spinning salon chair surrounded by mirrors and talked about our livers. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I could that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we, we sat in the spinning chair, salon chairs, surrounded by mirrors and talked about our lives. He, he seemed a little sad. I'm sure I seemed a little wounded. We weren't shining breath blessed new age seekers who had, we weren't the shining new, breath blessed new age seekers who had, bit, had sat beside the mountain stream, but we both wanted to be. He came to one of my gigs and watched me sing. He also wa he also played music. I knew the music scene in Boulder excited him. One night he came to my apartment. We did cocaine and drank scotch. I told him about my dream and the meditation by the stream and him walking across the bridge. I wasn't the first girl to think Bill was my soulmate. It seemed like he had this had had this conversation a thousand times. He seemed burdened by the story. But when I got up to go to the bathroom, he went with me. Neither of us could bear to stop the conversation, even for the needs of elimination. I was drunk enough and high enough to not care. He said, the only woman I've ever gone to the bathroom with while they were peeing, I was married to. I said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. He smiled. We kept on talking. Cocaine was not a sexy drug for me. Cocaine just made me want to talk and talk and talk. Body, what body? I finally laid down in the bed and tried to sleep. My body was wired and tense. Bill went out to the bars. Boulder was a small town. I never locked my door. The day after my talk with Bill, I came home and his suitcase was in my living room. A few days went by, I came home and it was gone. I had heard a few stories from friends. People had seen him around town in clubs. I knew where he was staying, so I called and asked him what was going on, but he was curt and distant. He was beginning a relationship with another woman. Eventually he married her and they had two children. Three. It happened a third time. A friend began to come to my house every day. 
I would listen for the sound of his car in the driveway. It was a Volkswagen. I made dinner and he fixed the light switch, the cable, and the, tele and the table level. He was handy and I could cook. We watched TV. He held the remote control. It was like being married, but I wasn't getting laid on Friday night. It wasn't like Bill or Lee, but I felt comforted by his presence. I would have married him. And the minute I began to talk about those feelings, he stopped coming to my house. I heard he was dating a woman. I heard they got married. I think I reparented myself with God. My relationship with Baba completed that quest. In some ways, my life divided into before India and after India. I still look to God as a provider in the material world, a matchmaker, booking agent, employment agent, agency, travel agent, and the general source of all things. I believed I needed divine, divine intervention to get laid. All men were characters in my myth-making. And my myth was about being abandoned and betrayed. I still believed that I was hiding inside a fat suit waiting to be seen. It was difficult for me to accept that all of these unfulfilled romances were solely because of an amount of flesh. I know there are men who prefer fat women. I have had men flirt with me. It seems a bit problematic to me that a man might like me because I am fat. It seems like the opposite side of a coin. I was attracted to a musician once, before those three times. He would stop by my table between sets and flirt. I enjoyed the endorphin rush. He told my friend to tell me that he thought I was very cool, but that I was just too much for him. At the time, we both laughed. Babo was my matchmaker. Three men in a row loved me, wanted to be with me all the time, didn't want to fuck me. It seemed that I was, it seemed that I was a nun, whether I had consciously chosen to be or not. When I would tire of a relationship that felt intimate but never got horizontal, I would ask them to leave me alone. Three men in a row married other women very soon after they spent intimate time with me. It all seems fraught with meaning, but maybe it was just bad faith.